Hello, I'm Kiara Owens, and I just want to thank you for joining Montgomery Focus. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Tommy Stewart with us. She's done so much from <laughs> acting to education to just being a part of the civil rights movement after the movement. So <laughs> thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's so good to see you again, Kiera. <laughs> and when you reminded me that you were in TAPS, I mean, <laughs> that's amazing. You all are just the joy of my life. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for just the impact that you've had on me since I was six years old. That's <laughs> when I joined the program. So mm -hmm. I can just thank you. Well, um, did we let the audience know that TAPS is a theater artist performance school when little six to 12 year olds take acting, singing, dancing, and they're just so cute. Yeah. And now look at you, all cute and grown up. <laughs> yes, it's a theater arts program that I've been a part of since I was six, like I said. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that was when I was truly exposed to the theater arts. And even then I knew how big you were. Oh. And you were so reachable and you always talk to me oh. and just to everybody. So I, like I said, thank oh, you Bless again. you, bless you. And uh, okay, so I guess we'll start off. Where <laughs> are you from? From Greenwood, Mississippi, that's in the okay. Delta. And in the Delta of Mississippi, you know, there's an area not far from Greenwood called Sugar Ditch, the poorest county in all of America. Wow. So uh, when I was growing up, that county was really poor and the Delta, LaFleur County, we didn't know how poor we were, but we were always happy, we were always enthusiastic, and always motivated by our elders to make something of ourselves, to make a contribution, to dis determine in your mind and in your heart that you're gonna be somebody, and to understand that God will get you there. The way is already made. That's what they constantly told us. Wow. The way is already made. <laughs> so you had a lot of support even from the beginning, yeah. In my home, in my community, in my church, and my school, yes. Wow. My mother was an elementary school teacher, and she was a choir director at church, and my father uh, had challenges with his education and uh, his, his drinking and, mm. you know, being, not being able to become the man that he felt inside growing in him to be. So it was very difficult for him, and it was painful to watch him go through the trials of his life. Wow. Um, but then my grandmother uh, was a great cook, and she loved to dance. <laughs> and my mother loved to play the piano and sing, and my dad loved to sing as well. Then um, in, in the community, we had Miss Suds, we had Miss Hattie, we had all of these neighbors that were a part of the village that laid hands on us, that prayed over us. And at church, we had to be involved in all of the programming, the choir, wow. the Sunday school, the YMCA, the YWCA, the everything, Dang. if you name it, we were involved. And then at school, there was a band, there was a choir, there was a track team, there was a basketball team. I was involved in all of that. So, yeah. You were on the basketball team? Yeah, I played wow, with the basketball I didn't team until I broke my ankle. <laughs> oh, man. Surely did, yeah. So, in your case, the village truly did help raise oh, you. Oh, the village. It was a village, And yes. even though it was a small town, the relationships were there. Very real yeah. relationships. And you respected your, your, your neighbors, and you respected the directions that they gave you. And they were not afraid to tell you to shut up, sit down. <laughs> you know, go here, go there, you right. can't go, you can't do that. They would tell you that <laughs> just like your own parent. And it was serious. Miss Cora, my neighbor, Miss Cora spoke on one breath. Girl, what you think you're going today? And you know you ain't got no business doing that. Uh, I done told you about being out here this late. You know, just, oh, yeah. Miss Cora. And you had to listen and you had to obey. <laughs> oh, Miss Cora. Yes. Okay, so you um, already basically said, like, what what it was like growing up? Oh yeah, you know? oh so. yeah, oh yeah. Uh, these are characters that I w was able to um, infuse into the roles that I played. Wow. Um, knowing Miss Cora and Miss Suds, it was easy for me when it was time to play Mama from A Raisin in the Sun on the stage, or to play uh, Mrs. Valdez in Footfalls. Any of the shows that I, I had an opportunity to do. I would think back about my, my community. When I did the television show, ER, I, I really brought the character to life of my mother-in-law. 
That's my mother-in-law, that character. <laughs> wow. So, like, every character you've played, you pulled from somebody oh, yes. in your past. That's oh, yes. great. Yes, to, it, was, it was real to me that way, yeah. It's kind of like it was set up, like, <laughs> God put people in your life that, you know, you would have to play. That's right. In the he future. Put them That's in my great. little computer. <laughs> <laughs> your file folder. Okay. Um, so, you kind of touched on the fact that your family were all like singers and you know instrument players now what how did you get started or interested in acting well you see the acting was something that came relatively natural hmm. because actually my mother wanted me to learn musical instruments she rented a piano a xylophone an accordion uh, to get me started and I wasn't interested because my yeah. goal as a child was to become a medical doctor. That was my dream. Wow. So I, I should have brought my bracelet. I'm going to start wearing my bracelet. <laughs> I have all of these wonderful medals for winning science fair projects uh, throughout junior high and high school. As a matter of fact, the scholarship that took me to college was in biology uh, to Jackson State University. Now, while wow. at Jackson State, I had been in a lot of plays at church, a lot of plays um, in, in high school, and the drama director at Jackson State had seen me in competition at the state play festivals. And when I'm sitting in his speech class, and he says, aren't you Tommy? And I said, yes, that was Mr. E.J. Fisher. Mm. Later he became Dr. E.J. Fisher. And he said, uh, I have an audition tonight, and I want you to be there. And I said, ah, he said, be there. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. So I was there, and I had landed the lead role in a play called um, High Ground. I was a nun, and I actually had to wear the full habit. We went to the uh, Catholic Church and borrowed from one of the nuns one of their wow. habits. Yeah. So uh, from that moment on, it, was, it remains history. I found myself not being comfortable in the biology lab because they, we, had, they, we were about to dissect a, a, a raccoon and a, <laughs> and a cat. And I just could not, I don't, I don't take a lot of fancy to these hairy yeah. little in, animals. And so I told my professor, I said, please let me be excused. I think I'm getting sick. So he uh, excused me and I went in the hallway and I cried. And I said, I'm going to lose my scholarship. Oh, I knew I was going to lose it. But then um, I went to talk with uh, Mr. Fisher. And he said, well, it seems like that's not in your soul. That's not your spirit. He said, it's in your head, but it's not in your spirit. Yeah. And I always counted on the spirit because I feel, I feel that the spirit is the God in us. And I said, oh, you think so? So that's all I needed. Yeah. I changed my major. And it was the right thing to it do. It was the right <laughs> thing to do. Out. So you went from lab coats to costumes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. In a year. Yeah. That's <laughs> wow. true. Wow. Yes. That's awesome. And so, um, do you did you still keep in contact with him when you? Oh my goodness, with Dr. Fisher. Yeah. Oh yes, we ended up in graduate school together. Um, wow. He brought the, you know he would put on the bulletin board. Uh, the various opportunities and he, he was getting at the class one day and said you all should go to the bulletin board and I expect every one of you to apply to at least mm. two of these schools they're offering opportunities for you and I always believe in the number seven so I applied to seven and one was Yale another was uh, um, Ohio State University of Indiana and uh, Santa Barbara uh, those are the ones that I can remember off the top of my head because those four responded to me. Wow. And I was invited to audition at Yale and New Stage Theater in Jackson, Mississippi, where I had started participating in community productions. They financed my trip to Yale and even made uh, preparations for where I would live while there and who would take me from place to place. And that was a whole, that's a whole different story. <laughs> but let me tell you, it was wonderful to be on that campus. And uh, I was placed on the alternate list because there was a guy from Africa that they chose over me. Mm. And um, in the meantime, I'm on the alternate list. 
Santa Barbara placed me on the first place list. And I accepted Santa Barbara because I'd always had this vision that I would end up one day in California and that I would one day uh, make a real mark while in California. I'd always had that vision. So when the opportunity said, hey, Santa Barbara, you have a scholarship, I accepted it immediately. Wow. And then I got word from Yale that you've been moved up to first place. But it was too late. I went with, the, with Santa Barbara, and I do not regret Santa Barbara. It was a wonderful experience. I had a chance to meet Frank Silvera. He was brought in as the guest director, and Frank Silvera found something in me that I didn't know I had. He said that you are a being actress, and I didn't know what that meant. And he taught me what being was all about. And he then said to me in front of my schoolmates, that I've only met one other that's a natural being actress, and that's B. Riches. Have you ever heard of her? He said, she's from Mississippi. I said, I'm from Mississippi. Oh, wow. And he said, oh, my God, that's it. <laughs> and Frank Severo was a, a light in my life oh. and um, guided me to uh, understanding and appreciating reality when it comes to performing. And. Uh, he took me to L.A., introduced me to B. Richards, and she and I became fast friends after that, of course. He died uh, right at the time of my graduation. Oh, and uh, B. and I became closer. Um, it was very difficult and very painful. Uh, through Frank Severa, I had a chance to get to know and communicate with Marlon Brando, Juanita Moore, Esther Rowe, B. Richards. Um, Whitman Mayo, who was Grady on Sanford and Son, these personalities contributed to my research for my dissertation. Uh, and I'm hoping that the Center of Excellence at Alabama State University will be the place where anyone will be able to go and find more data that uh, I was able to secure while doing my research uh, with these personalities that I just mentioned. It's a, it's a, the story is so vast. It it's goes so like many different your directions. Your steps were ordered. It's amazing <laughs> yes. that everything just fell into place like that. God is real. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, okay, I guess I'll skip to this one. Since you brought up graduate school, I know you were the first African-American to graduate, to get a graduate degree from, no, to receive a doctorate. That's right. From FSU School of Theater. That's right, yes. How was that? That was a challenge. Uh -oh. <laughs> All of these challenges. You know, I, I realize that we have to walk through the fire, mm -hmm. and you have these stumbling blocks, but all you have to do is keep believing and keep on trucking. Keep your eyes on the prize. Florida State was an opportunity where um, the McKnight Foundation and this is now called the Florida Endowment Fund. Okay. But it was the Binger family that started uh, giving money to give uh, African Americans an opportunity to matriculate and study in a field where there were few PhDs. So many of the uh, PhDs in engineering, in uh, technology, in the sciences, and then in the theater there were very, very few PhDs in theater. Right. Now you have some people who have educational doctorates and they have a PhD in the liberal arts or whatever, but in theater, pure theater, African Americans were not in that number, very yeah. few in the country. So uh, I had to go to Florida State uh, because in my state of Mississippi there was not a PhD program in theater. So Florida was the closest state, and the foundation was funding participation at a university in Florida. So Florida State University ended up being that university, and my um, graduate degree was paid for by the Florida Endowment Fund, the McKnight Foundation. And the Binger family believed in me so much that when I came to work at Alabama State, they gave me the first $20,000 to help our program. They surely did. So yes, I was the first African-American female to receive a PhD from Florida State University in theater. 
-hmm. That is great. <laughs> and then they turned out to give you $20,000 to help out even after that. To help the students to at the Alabama students. State University. That's that right. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back to your family, I guess. When you <laughs> told your parents you wanted to be an actress, oh. were they supportive? No. Oh, man. My yeah. mother, she wanted me to do something in the arts. But when I said an actress, they just sort of didn't comment, didn't, didn't do anything to stop me, but didn't do anything to push me either. Um, they attended productions, whatever, I, whatever you know, program I was on, my mother and my grandmother would be there. My father wasn't there that much. Uh, he came sometimes. But um, people in the community, my friends, my playmates laughed. So you want to be on television, girl? You you dream it, wow. you know. <laughs> so I had to I had to learn to believe in myself, and I had to learn to trust in God, and I had to learn to understand that He is my God. You know, He says what happens. Man around me cannot dictate what happens in my life. So uh, I learned to put my trust in in God, and Whenever an opportunity would happen, I would try to take advantage of it. And by taking advantage of it, I was simply doing, as you said, following in the steps that were ordered for me. Um, I, th I thought, you know, sometimes we think that what we need to do is be here, be there. I thought I wanted to go to California and be the, the star. Mm -hmm. But God said, I want you to learn as much as you can get as much exposure as you can and then I want you to come and infuse that lesson into other children, other young people. And I, I, growing up my mother was a teacher, my sister and I declared we would never teach because <laughs> she became too involved in the lives of her students. She was so, I mean every Easter dress we had, she wanted to, whenever they had a program at the school, she'd take our dress and put it on one of the children and we said we will never teach. No, we won't do that. Both of us are teachers. <laughs> <laughs> and now you understand what made her. And when I like look that. at you, I understand. Aww. Because when I see the, the joy in your eyes that you, uh, did you have some direction for your focus, where you want to go, what you want to do, and that you have faith that you can do it, that is for me an Oscar. That's an Oscar. That's, that's an Emmy. So you would say your greatest accomplishment would be my students. Would be the students. Mm -hmm. Wow. When it comes to the career, it's my students. When it comes to my family, it's my children, and it's my, my family as a whole. I'm very proud of them all. Uh, but when it comes to my career, I'm very, very honored when I look at the students that are on Broadway right now. Yeah. When I look at the students that's that's making movies right now. When I look at the students that are getting awards right now, I'm, I'm, I, I feel that I've answered my call and I'm doing it with God's grace. So, okay, when you, what was the thing that made you say, I'm gonna start a summer camp for children and I'm gonna start one for teenagers, for those who are disabled, I know you have one more for adults. Mm -hmm. What was it that, like, was there an event that made you decide that, or was it the, like, how, how you felt well, on the inside? Well, when I was in Mississippi at Jackson State, where I taught for 20 years, mm -hmm. I had a summer camp for children. And then I had a camp year-round for children. So when I came to Alabama State University, we started with, with the first camps that I had was the, the, the camp for little children, TAPS, ages 6 to 12. Then the 4-H club people came and said from Auburn that we want to train our 4-H members to do the same things you're doing with the little children. So we had the camps and it was all successful. And there was a lot of joy and a lot of rewards from the young people. And then the 4-H decided to pull out and start having a different type camp. Then I decided with the help of my coworkers and my students, let's continue the camp. Let's do it for the teenagers and call it Camp 3T. And Miss Jackson, who is now my administrative assistant, she came up with the name 3T. And we said, let's see, what does that mean? Teaching through theater. 3T, wow. that's it. And so we, we together, she was a student at the time, uh, felt that we should continue this for Alabama State University's 
community, for the children in the community. Then it spread out, and now we have participants coming from all over the United States. And it's sort of like a best kept secret, and that maybe you'll help us get the word out yeah. that we've been doing this over 20 years, and we have children busing in, churches sending buses of students, the public schools in New York sending a busload of students from New York to Camp 3T, and then uh, the, the uh, group from Tennessee, from uh, Massachusetts, all of these places, Florida, Georgia, sending van loads of students to our Camp 3T, and the students are, are leaving and ending the camp fulfilled. Yes. It is amazing. You know, I remember when I went to Camp 3T, I, I rarely met other people from Alabama. Right. Everybody was like, oh, I'm from Atlanta. Right. Especially Atlanta. I'm mm -hmm. from, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, Chicago. Mm -hmm. Right. And I thought that was awesome. Like, it was a great experience for me to be a teenager and meet people from all over. And we all the moved same. in the dorm. Yes. And ate the dining hall. So, yeah, it was, it's beautiful. And we, we're still doing that camp every summer, both of them. And then we, once I, I recognized, I, I looked around at one of the performances and I saw some physically challenged young people sitting there applauding and, and you know, pushing for Camp 3T participants. And I said, wait a minute, they should be up there too. Yeah. So then we started Camp Gifted. And Dr. Coleman is now in charge of that camp. And then we started Camp RPAC, Adult Repertory Performing Arts Camp. And that one, we're going to start back back this summer. We stopped for two summers because we were just worn out. Yeah. But we're going to continue that one as well. Well, I think it's awesome. It gives mm -hmm. kids a way to grow in their talents, and it gives them yes. something to do in the summer. You know. And, but the, 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 the resounding mission is to give everybody the confidence to know that they can be and they can do. Though you're physically challenged, you're somebody and you have something to offer. And you can sing a song or say a word or move on the stage, even if it's in a wheelchair, to motivate somebody in that audience. So it becomes a communal experience. And that's what being that Frank Severa taught me. It was it's so important that it becomes communal, not just a presentation, not just a performance, but a communal experience where everybody learns and appreciate the fact that you are complete and perfect. You're in a complete and perfect state and you lack no essential characteristics. So what can you lack when you're breathing? What do you lack when you see, when you hear? What do you lack if you can't walk, but you can feel and you can express? You are complete and you're perfect. That was great. <laughs> Look at wow. Um, OK. So now we're going to get more into talking about your career, oh, okay. which I'm sure is what everybody wants to know about. <laughs> um, what are the biggest obstacles that you faced in your career? Well. Um, Viola Davis really worded it well when she received her award the other night. The fact that we are African American and we are female and we don't have the means to get produced our stories. When we have no one really writing for us and no one even interested in pushing us. But that time is changing and it's a, it's a wonderful battle to have won. And whether I personally benefit or not, it's okay. But if you benefit, then it makes it worth it. It makes the contribution, it makes the being overlooked, it makes the uh, being um, not recognized worth it. So the obstacles have been, first, I'm in the South, okay. and I never vied to live anywhere else. I, I, I feel like um, having a family, I always felt that I wanted my children to be raised in that village environment. And they did benefit from that village environment. And I'm very, very thankful to our church, 
I'm at Hutchinson Missionary Baptist Church. I'm very thankful to our community and, and to uh, the, the, the university, Alabama State University, allowing me to have the summer camps. And then my children participated as well. And I'm very thankful to the prayer warriors out there that really, a lot of young people, you, don't, you all don't know, that they have people praying for you every day. I mean, they are praying vigilantly for our children, and they have always done it from slavery. They've prayed, and those prayers are being answered. So the obstacles that we've had were just a part of walking through the fire, just a part of having another landing to reach, and just a part of the test that God puts before us that we must go through and that we must accept in order to make the goal. So those obstacles, I just don't even count them anymore. And like you said, um, just looking at all of the new movies coming out with oh, yeah. a lot of African Americans in them beautiful. that are women, it's great. It's beautiful. So That's Chandra Grimes producing, Lee Daniels directing. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm so proud of them and for them. Well, I have a video of you acting in Mississippi Dam. Ah. <laughs> and I thought it was very like powerful and raw. And they're going to play it right now. And the young lady that directed and wrote it is my sorority sister. Wow. Yeah, she went to school, attended college in Mississippi. She's now in L.A. and she's getting ready to do more. Uh, so let it roll. And like while they get the video ready to play, yeah. how do you get in that frame of mind like when you're about to do such a serious, emotionally raw video? Well, it goes back to Frank Severo's theater of being. Right. You become. You step into that, you, know, you listen to the words, you look at the words, and you make them your own. And you don't do that by going through any special method. You know, being is where you simply become the vessel. You, it's almost like um, being placed in a trance or being hypnotized wow. and told to bark, and you sound just like a dog. You know, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a process of accepting the reality of who this person is, okay? Well, I'm sure they have it coming up soon. Okay. Yep. Whatever it is you're asking for, I ain't got it. You best run on back to that uh, uh, Willie Roy. His name is Heck. Don't make me no difference. All you did is trade in a whole monger for a crackhead. So just go on back to him and ask him whatever it is you want. I ain't never asked for nothing I didn't deserve. <laughs> You always talk about you deserve something. Somebody owe you. You owe me. And asking for $20 don't even come close I don't to it. Owe you nothing. Now, if anybody owe you, it's your daddy. So why don't you go on out to White Oak Cemetery and take it up with him? Oh, you owe me just as much as him. Hell, you owe more. I ain't did nothing to you. Oh, for me. Ain't no way you slept through all them nights daddy was in my room. Oh, uh, you ought to hush. How bloody did you need the sheets to get for you could ask what was going on, Mama? <clears throat> Go on now. I ain't got no time to argue or fuss with you. Well, how bloody, Mama? It's on your head. You ain't gonna put it on me. You need to forget all about the past and going with your life. Straight out. I ain't gonna take no responsibility for your little fast. You ain't no good. You think Daddy wanted to be up in my room? Oh. Hmm? You made him do it. You need to hush. On, you need to hush, baby. You, were you need to hush. Him, so he came in my room. What that got to do with? You want twenty dollars? Get the twenty dollars. Get the twenty dollars and get on out the room. After performing 
such an emotional role. Are you able to just turn that emotion off, like, right after? Pretty much, yes. Wow, so that comes with... Yes, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a skill. Um, you, it, it's, it's like life. One moment you, um, you're crying about something and the phone rings or somebody walks in the room and you happen to see them and you drop it because that's another turn in your, in your psychic, in your emotion, in your spirit. So, yes. Um, mm -hmm. So, out of all the roles you've played, oh boy, which one is your favorite? Everybody asks that. It's hard <laughs> to say. I feel so blessed to have any role. Right. Uh, the role that has really made a mark for me has been A Time to Kill. And of course, um, In the Heat of the Night as Miss Etta Kibbe. Uh, those really helped me a lot. I, I loved the role uh, that Della Reese wrote for me in Touch by an Angel. She wrote that script, and that was a, a gift to me from her. Aww. I was so, so proud and so grateful. Um, the other shows, I'm just, I mean, I love Walker, Texas Ranger. I love what I did there with, uh, with Matlock, with Andy Griffin. Uh, you just done so many. I'm like, just so grateful. Yeah. I'm, so it's hard for me to say I like this one better than that one because the one we just played, Mississippi Dam, was a joy to do. Uh, it was a, a different character, different angle. You know, in that one, I'm even, I get a chance to be possibly the first African-American female to literally shoot in a coffin. Yeah, when you see it, <laughs> I didn't tell my sister. When wow. we went to see the premiere, <laughs> yeah. she almost wrecked the theater. <laughs> <laughs> and I know your sister, so I can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> she did. Wow. Well. But they were trying to check on the statistics to see if we had had an African-American female to literally be viewed in a coffin before and we, we talked about it and they started checking on it and they didn't find anyone so um, it remains to be told whether I'm the first. Wow. Yeah. Well, keep me updated. Okay. If you find out you were the first. Okay. Um, okay. So you've played a variety of roles. Like you've done some that are, you know, I think you've done one that was kind of like a, like a mystery, like yeah. Type of one. Oh, yeah. In Mistress of Paradise, that's yeah. one where I'm like a voodoo woman. Yeah. And then in um, the television series, Old oh, Man, we filmed it in New Orleans where I'm a seer. Uh, and then um, I've been the maid in many of them and an older woman, uh, uh, you know, in most of them. Yeah. But I had a chance to play closer to myself in A Time to Kill and in uh, Walker, Texas Ranger uh, as a principal. But on Walker, I was a principal, I was a judge, I was a um, juror, uh, those juror on Matlock. Ooh they all get mixed up. <laughs> and then uh, there, there's a series that was on years ago that uh, I had a, the pleasure of working with called The Mississippi with Ralph Waits. And that one hasn't come back yet, but it, was, it ran for a year or two called the Mississippi. And then um, for educational television, I was in the series called Edit Point and um, Just Around the Corner, those two series. Had a chance to work with Judith Light and uh, Michelle Shade, some of the really talented Broadway actresses. So I've been very, very fortunate. It's hard for me to say which one was my favorite. It really is. Which one was the most challenging you say, like that required the most out of you? Ooh, yeah, that's a real good question because maybe a time to kill because it was dealing with a child and I love children <laughs> and the idea that somebody would hurt a child like they hurt Raven in that show, yeah. uh, our, our daughter, maybe a time to kill. I've never been asked that before. That's a very, very, I'm going to think about that one because I, when I think about A Time to Kill, it was no problem for me to cry, no problem for me to feel hate and anger, um, and then to just feel helpless 
There were so many moods in that particular one. Mm -hmm. So it required a lot of out of you emotionally. Yes, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Wow. Yes. And that was one of your most known mm -hmm. pieces. A lot of recognition from that one. Was actually <clears throat> nominated for an Image Award for that one, and uh, an Emmy for In the Heat of the Night. Um, so maybe at Time to Kill was the most that took the most out of me. Because I, I do remember, after being in court those days, how drained I felt. How drained I felt. And, and Matthew McConaughey used to come and grab my hands and just look into my eyes, and the tears would just fall. Aww. And it was, some, it was some, something happening with us there every day. So much so that Sam said, hey, hey, <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Jackson said, well, who side you on? Now you my wife, you know, you, 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 you hold my hand. <laughs> but Matthew would come and just reach for my hands. Aww. And I would just hold him and I'd look at him. And I started, and I would tell myself, you got you to gotta do something to save my husband. You, no one could save my daughter. You know, what happened to her would be damaged for life. And I would think all of that when he would hold my hand. And he said to me, he said, I got it, I got it. It was almost like he felt what I was sending to him. And uh, that, was, that was also very, very powerful. Yeah, every day I would feel a sense of being drained. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's good, though, that, you know, when you're acting and you're a part of a show for so long, you start forming relationships. And were they oh, going yes. through the same things you were? as far as being drained at the end of the day. Do you still talk to Matthew McConaughey or well, I Samuel was, Jackson? I, I was on a set with him this summer. Oh. Uh, he's doing um, uh, The Free State of Jones. And uh, I have a scene in there that I hope they'll keep. But um, I got to see him and we were able to embrace. And he says, oh, Tania, I remember. I said, I do too. <laughs> and, you know, and then I keep in touch with Samuel Jackson from that show. Uh, and Charles Dutton, Rock, I keep in touch with him. And from In the Heat of the Night, we are, we are all pretty much pretty close. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah they're the ones that are still living. So many. We've lost so many. I know that's that hard. It is. <coughs> it, it's frightening because it's almost like, who's next? Oh, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. <sighs> well, um, okay. What is it that you liked? least about making movies or, or like being on TV shows? Auditioning. <laughs> I do not like auditioning. Right. Oh my goodness, I, I, it's, it's a, such a test to audition. And it's so wonderful when you're called and say, we want you. And I've had some of those calls. Um, but when you have to audition, I, I do not like that process. I really don't. I don't like that. Uh, fortunately, when for a time to kill, I was to go in for an audition at the last moment, and when I arrived at the place and walked in the room, um, the director said, um, "Hello, Gwen." <laughs> I said, "No, no, no, no. I'm Tania." <laughs> he says, <laughs> "Really?" I said, "Yes. Have a seat, Gwen." He kept calling me Gwen. <laughs> And I didn't audition. We ended up talking. We ended up talking. We ended up laughing. We ended up crying together. And the next thing I knew, I was in that role. Because I was helping to look for someone else, a younger person, to play the role. And it ended up being you. And it ended up being me. Wow. Mm -hmm. OK, so I know that you're working on a, a new movie. That I think it's with Anna Kendrick, the Pitch Perfect star. And can oh. you tell me anything about that? I don't know a thing about it. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking on um, online, you know, looking up stuff. About uh, you. And I saw that it said you were like filming a movie called The Hollers. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've done that. Oh, it's over. Yes. That, that's an, um, it's an independent. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that was she was from Pitch Perfect. <laughs> yeah, she's on she's on Pitch Perfect. She's wow. been in a few 
major. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. Oh, She's see, on Pitch Perfect. In this industry, they, they bring you in, you, you, you getting in the makeup, hair, and wardrobe, you put on the set. There are no real introductions and all like that. Right. Uh, other than knowing that this person is your daughter or this person. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a real good experience, the hollers. How'd you find out about that? I did my research. <laughs> I did my research. You're right. <laughs> yeah, wow. she was in a few, like, I think she was also in Twilight. Okay. The Twilight's uh, series, okay. the movies. So she was in a few big Wow. <laughs> I remember her and I didn't realize that's who that was. Yep. <laughs> uh, the same thing when we were working on Constellation. All of those wonder oh my lord, uh, wonderful names. Um, and my children had to tell me and my coworkers, you working with her? And, I, and my husband said, Hill Hopper is my, my star. <laughs> I said, he is. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so you don't even. But they were all very, very, very nice to work with. And yeah. humble, like they very, just didn't go around saying, I was in this. No, or, no, they don't do that. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. Okay, so now I want to talk more about your, the education side of you. Okay. Because you've been in education for over 40 years. 45 years, higher education. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what brought you from teaching at in Mississippi to Alabama State? <laughs> Let me see if I can make it short. Okay. Um, I had been at uh, Jackson State University for 20 years, teaching um, and directing, and had some fabulous students and wonderful productions. And uh, once I received my doctorate, uh, we just sort of put the fillers out to try other, other opportunities. And sure enough, uh, I had five offers. And out of the five offers, one school made a comment, said, who do we have to compete with to get you? Because we want you and your husband. And uh, we said, well, we've been looking at Alabama State. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the little penny ante universities. Who, who else? And when he said that, that he struck me and my husband the wrong way. Little penny ante university. Yeah. And um, when we, they, they sent a plane for us. They flew us in, showed us the house we would be in. They would get, you know, put in the house with the contract. We um, got back on the plane and we were headed home. And I said, I'm going to write you a note and tell you out of these five schools where, which, which one comes first to me. And he said, okay. I said, I want you to do the same thing. He said, okay. So we wrote a note. And when we got home and we sat down for breakfast the next morning, I said, you got your note? He said, yeah. And we opened our notes, and we both had Alabama State as number one. Wow. And I said, why? Why did you do it? He said, did you hear what that man say about that penny ante? I said, I heard it. He said, that was it. They, when people want to discount me as a human being and say that we're penny ante, we're nothing, we're less than, he said, that was it. And I remember that conversation that we had. I said, okay then, that's it then, you know? And the children were really rejoicing in it because they really didn't want to leave Mississippi. It was very difficult on them uh, because they had so many friends and they loved what they were doing there. And, and Jackson, Mississippi is a fast moving place. It's a lot going on. Uh, so when we were coming to Alabama State University, and um, I was here filming with um, James Earl Jones with Saturday Night with Connie Chung, and Dr. Ralph Bryson was an extra that day, and he saw me, and he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, now, aren't you the one they wrote about in the Chronicle? I said, what did they write? You're the first one to graduate from Florida, Florida State. Aren't you the one? Aren't you a Mac Knight? He's so smart, Dr. <laughs> Bryson. Yeah. I said, yes, that's me. He said, I want to show you something when you get a break. And he brought me over to the campus. And that's when I fell in love with the campus. And when he, he walked me over and introduced me to Mr. Bertram Martin. Bertram Martin had retired. But they walked me through the theater building. And when I saw for the first time on a historically black 
campus, a legitimate theater space, uh, dressing rooms, dance studio, black box ticket booth, that blew my mind. Didn't know that at the time that they were that the state was in the process of eliminating theater from the curriculum at Alabama State University altogether. And I told Dr. Bryson, I said, I can't believe this. He said, it's right here, just need somebody to lead it. So he took me to the president, to the dean, uh, Dr. Thomas, and to the president, Dr. Leon Howard. And to my surprise, Leon Howard and I had worked together at Jackson State. And he said, Tommy, would you really leave Jackson State? He couldn't believe it. I said, for a space like this? <laughs> and I said, yes, indeed. And uh, so we came to Jackson State, and sure enough, there was nothing happening in the theater. There was one student, Cynthia Mathis, who was a, um, I think she was a minor in theater at the time. Uh, no other students. I put on a sandwich board, and I walked around the campus, and somebody called the press and said, they picketing Alabama State University. But I was picketing for players and passing out leaflets to students during the lunch hour, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And students would come, and I'd meet with them and tell them what the theater was all about. And we started doing productions. And the rest of it is history. I am literally taken aback right now because you're telling me that you were responsible from taking the university to almost being taken out of oh it was being it was slated to be discontinued and you no took theater. that and made it to be the top hbcu for theater in the whole nation isn't that something that is amazing isn't that in god and now that, you, that's god and you have students on broadway we have students on broadway uh, in Lion King and Kinky Boots, in um, uh, I can't oh Amazing Grace, Leona Weaver, uh, just start. I mean, she just started, and she's a leading actress in the show Amazing Grace on Broadway right now. Uh, they've been in A Raisin in the Sun. They've been in Motown. They've been you name the shows that have been a success on Broadway, and they have African-American stars, Memphis, uh, J. Bernard Calloway, I mean, Leona Michelle, J. Bernard Calloway, Benita Hamilton Caesar, uh, Tim Ware, the list goes on, Charlie Hudson, and on. I could just keep calling names. <laughs> God is so good. And these were little bright-eyed students who were walking around that campus not knowing what they wanted to do and now they are revered. So what Fisher did to you, you had the opportunity to do that to other students at Alabama State. That's right. And me being a student of ASU, I know just the impact that the theater has had on the whole university. So not We have only about 178 majors now, and we have always had since 1990, the largest number of African-American males in theater than any university in the country. Dr. Stewart, I think that is definitely one of your top accomplishments. I told you that's I, my Oscar. That is it. That's my Oscar. I had no idea. Like, <laughs> that's my Tony. <sighs> that's my Emmy. And now you're the dean yeah. of the whole visual and performing mm -hmm. arts that's right. college at ASU. Well, okay, you do a lot <laughs> from, you know, you have a family, yes. you're still doing projects. Yes. With like Anna, Anna Kendrick, the one who's in Pitch Perfect, <laughs> you didn't even know. Um, and you're just involved in a lot of other extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. How do you balance all of well, that? Well, uh, God is so good. I mean, I, I have to give him the glory. Um, because he wakes me up and, and he pats me on my back and pushes me forward uh, with visions as he did for the Martin Luther King celebration at the 50th uh, Selma Montgomery March and then for the mayor to call me in and say, I want you to work on this reenactment on the steps of the Capitol for the 50th. And now we're getting ready for the 60th 
with the Rosa Parks and for Miss Bartley from the MIA and uh, Dr. John Knight to to single me out and, and the mayor to say, okay, you're going to put Tommy with it and I'm fine with that. <laughs> uh, we're going to work together to make that Rosa Parks reenactment happen. When I think about the faith that people have in me and the encouragement that they give me, I'm, I'm e equally humbled. Um, I'm getting teary-eyed about yeah. it because, <laughs> because, you know, they don't have to they don't have to respect you. They don't have to acknowledge you. Uh, when we did the first Martin Luther King celebration in Mississippi um, in 87, after that celebration was over, uh, the Williams brothers got together and started the Mississippi Mass Choir with the same choir that we had. We had our first King celebration uh, this 2015, January, and I understand that now a citywide choir is being formed. I said, well, this time we're going to have to work together, you know, because it's, it's, it's just um, it's, it's unfair when you have different uh, people pulling on what you're doing and not acknowledging that you've done it. And I'm getting too old now, and I'm getting too um, tired to just uh, let anyone just walk on me and, and not acknowledge the, the, the dedication and the commitment and the place where it's all coming from. It's not me, it's the God that, that's in me, that he's using me as a vessel. And I want anyone that's going to take anything that we're doing now to acknowledge that, that God is there and that we're able to do this because this vessel was used. I, th I think it's time. I do too. I think it's time. <laughs> I, you know, you just reminded me. One of the things that I remember the most about Camp 3T mm -hmm. is when you would come on stage and start just a whole, <laughs> I don't even know what to call it, just a whole just movement of people sharing stories. And, That's and, right. And we would have those spiritual encounters. Of yes. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. We, when, we, we, when someone, when Rosa Parks sat down, I'm not sure that everyone around the world realized how important and what an impact that had. So if, we, if any one of us should do anything today, we need to acknowledge it and not sponge off of it and try to make our own. We need to acknowledge. That's one thing I have to say about the Koreans, the Japanese, the Asians, the Mexicans, the European Americans. They don't try to equate anybody to Elvis Presley. You know what I'm saying? I'm just using that as an example. Elvis is Elvis. He's the king. He is, and there will never be anyone that they would sponge off of his contribution to this world and never acknowledge that he did what he did. But sometimes in our culture, we just won't do it. And it's, it's so unfair. But I'm so glad that we are finally acknowledging all of that we can on, on Rosa Parks, Claudette Colvin, um, Ms. Wilson, uh, Dr. King, E.D. Nixon, Ralph Abernathy. We're finally beginning to, but we need to do more of it. And as we recognize those that are coming behind them and still trying to make a mark and recognize the legacy of our people, that we would start to acknowledging that and at least just say their name. That's why Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey was so wonderful. When she honored all of those women, she said, and I call your name. When she did that, I wept like I was right there. <laughs> and some of them I had had a chance to work with. Della Reese, Esther Rowe, Debbie Allen, so many of them, uh, Maya Angelou, when, and, and Ruby D. when they called their names, I was just stood up and said, yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, that, that's why she's so successful. 
because her spirit is good and it's real. And she's not trying to usurp anybody else. She acknowledges she doesn't. Tyler Perry has made a great contribution to her network and his name is prominently there. She doesn't say Oprah Winfrey and not, and not Tyler. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If we, if we must, we must acknowledge the strength of who we are and how we got. And that's why I can't talk and say anything without acknowledging God. I can't talk about my history without acknowledging E.J. Fisher. And I need to also mention Leola G. Williams. People listening may not know, but somebody out there might know. And they need to know yes so that they can say yes. They can say yes when they hear Margaret Walker Alexander. They can say yes when I say Frank Severa or Whitman Mayo. They know. And God is going to make sure that somebody will always know. So we should always acknowledge upon what foundation we're building. We should always. I agree. And <laughs> that's why I acknowledge you with like really spawning my love of theater. Thank I tell you. everybody that um, any because I did a few plays in high school and I would always say I did Camp 3T. Mm -hmm. I did tap, so yes. thank you. And uh, okay, you've mentioned the civil rights a lot. Mm -hmm. um, have you had any personal experience oh, since yeah. in the civil rights movement? Yes, ma'am. You want to <laughs> share some? Oh, as a child in Mississippi, Mega Evers would come around and, and talk to groups and get us ready for the workers that were coming in. And of course, when we lost him, it was very painful. James Meredith uh, was the first to integrate Ole Miss. And my neighbor, Dewey Green, wanted to be the second. And when he um, tried to do that, it caused a real ruckus in our community. And late at night, we, heard, we had burning crosses, we had the Klan riders. Uh, we had meetings at our churches, and our, our parent would prepare food for the civil rights workers, and we had training on nonviolence. Uh, I was a part of all of that. And then we had the assignment to identify the houses where people could, uh, should be eligible to register to vote. And so I'll never forget going to Miss Cora's house, knocking on her door, one to introduce her to the civil rights workers who were going to help her register to vote. <laughs> they, a lot of folk were afraid, and they closed their doors. They see us coming, and I went and knocked on Miss Cora's door. Miss Cora, Miss Cora, I'm out here. This, this, hey, this baby sister. I don't <laughs> care what you're doing at my door. <laughs> well, we came to try to help you. We're getting all the colored people registered to vote. Colored. No, what did we say? <laughs> no, black people, I said, because at that time it was black. We're getting all the black people to get registered for black. Yeah, I ain't black. I'm light brown skin. Y'all get away from my door. I'll never <laughs> Well, Dr. Stewart, it has been a joy <laughs> to interview you and just to learn more about things that I, I had no idea about. Oh, yeah. So thank you for joining us this on Montgomery Focus. This has been Focus. wonderful. Thank you. It's been wonderful having you. So. <laughs> okay. And that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thank you for having me.